That's right. It's time for your Sports Bros podcast. Thanks for joining us. My name is Andy Karchner, a.k.a. Big Bro, coming at you for the last week from Phoenix, Arizona. I'm moving. Yeah, Andy, I don't think we're live. We are live. Oh, well, now we're live. So, uh, Eric Karchner from San Antonio, Texas. I'm the little bro of the Sports Bros tandem. Like Andy said, he's on his last week in Phoenix. He continues to move west and bring Cougar Nation all the way from Virginia to the Phoenix, heading up to Oregon now. So uh, tonight we've got Mitch Harper on the podcast with us. We're just going to kind of spitball a half an hour of BYU football. I know everybody's pretty stoked about that. Yeah, you can you can follow Mitch at Mitch underscore Harper. Follow us at Sports Bros, and our home is tornbysports.com. But we want to hop right into it. Mitch, thanks for joining us tonight. Excited to be here, guys. Football season is almost here. Cannot wait. It's you know seeing like picture day today practice, seeing the players starting to hit a little bit more. They haven't put on the full, all the pads yet, but uh, man, it's just you get excited about this time of the year for the possibilities that could potentially happen for this team. Mitch, I'm go- I'm gonna correct you. Fall camp has started. Football season is here. It is <laughs> it not is. almost here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, fall camp is the, the kickoff to the season, so it's it's a good feeling to have it back. Yeah, that's right. You know, we're gonna we'll get to the big news later, and I'm um, I'm gonna want to get your thoughts on the talkie talkie suspension uh, that that recently broke. But I guess just to start off, you've been there, as Aaron mentioned at the beginning of the show. I'm in Phoenix. Aaron's in Texas. I'm moving to Oregon. But you've been there. Do you just to start off the show? Have any thoughts, impressions, observations from f- four days of fall camp that stand out to you? Well, the biggest thing that stands out to me through four days is the fact that this team has, I think, a little bit more depth than maybe initially we expected. That was one of the big question marks that I had for this BYU team heading into the season is do they have enough depth to compete with one of the toughest schedules in all of college football? And I think that, I mean, that September schedule being dubbed by Phil Still as the toughest schedule in the country are they up for the challenge? Now, Tom Homo has said at Media Day that their depth can't hold up in the months of October and November against P5 teams, so that's why they front-load it with tough teams. But, um, you know, I think we're seeing flashes from the second and third stringers that make you think, man, that guy, if he continues to develop, there's going to be some really good things from these players moving forward. So I think that's a good sign for this team. I also think that, you know, just overall, Taysom Hill, 100% healthy, and there's no reason to think he's not going to be the Taysom that had the, the nation buzzing, leaping Texas. There's no reason to think he can't be that guy again, if not maybe better, because he just seems more confident in his role. He seems more poised. He even said today Bronco Mendenhall is, is giving him more responsibility and the players in general to kind of take charge of this team, and Taysom's up for the challenge, and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be an exciting year, I think, there's more possibilities than I think originally thought because going into this season, I thought maybe 7-5, and 8-4, and four, just because of the nature of what this BYU team has been the past few years, and you combine that with a tough schedule. But I think, you know, if things could go their way, they could overcome some things and, and maybe surprise some folks. Is there one particular position groups where you talked about the depth, that their depth is kind of sticking out to you where you didn't – you thought they were going to be a little more depleted? What, what group is sticking out to you? You know, the wide receiver group uh, is, is really impressed me in fall camp so far just because, you know, a lot of the names are familiar. They're guys that have produced, that they're confident in their roles. But I, I wonder, you know, who's going to be that second guy to Mitch Matthews now? Mitch Matthews, he hasn't participated in fall camp yet. Obviously, he's going to be coming back next week. He doesn't have a sports hernia, um, which is a good sign. So he's going to be nice. back full, full strength next week. Uh, but guy like Nick Kurtz, Nick Kurtz to me reminds me of Cody Hoffman 2.0. He's not an elite athlete but he's someone that's going to catch everything that's thrown his way. And he's someone that uh, it just he, if he can create separation, get enough space, he's going to become a very good wide receiver. And Taysom Hill and him are really gelling and connecting. Um, so I think that's a positive thing because you just wonder, with all the hype, and he's had a long layoff since he actually played a meaningful snap, is he going to be ready to go? And I think there's no reason to think that he won't be ready when BYU takes on Nebraska on September 5th. I think he's definitely that number two wide receiver. Then you add in Devon Blackman. Then you add in Mitchell Jurgens because those guys, I, I, wouldn't, I didn't feel comfortable going into the season as maybe one of those guys being the number two receiver. But you talk about Jurgens or Blackman being a third or a fourth wide receiver, I like that feeling a lot better because those guys are better suited for that type of role and that type of uh, responsibility, I think, because there's less pressure on them, on them, and I think they can surprise some folks. 
Well, and as you talk about Mitchell Jurgens, uh, it's an interesting dynamic now because we found out this week that they're going to try him out um, to fill some of these extra running back carries with Jamal out. Do you? How do you see the running back situation coming out? Nate Carter taking more carries, Mitchell Jurgens perhaps hopping in. Of course, uh, you know the talk about perhaps Harvey Longy stepping in. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, running back situation. I think there's there's not much of a drop off, and I, and I say that because I mean Jamal was terrific. He was someone that could really change the face of the game, and I think with Jamal Williams, if, if bounces went BYU's way, maybe you could have the discussion of maybe ten wins. Now, I'm, that's kind of you can't really say that right now because I think <laughs> this team has a lot to prove still. But I think you could have made the argument just because of taste in Jamal Williams' backfield. That's dynamic. That's explosive. Um, without that. Uh, makes me raise some some question marks about that backfield, but I think it's capable. Algie Brown is someone that um, you know what he is. He's going to be a good pass or a receiver out of the backfield. That's and even if Jamal was there, he would have been the best guy in that department. Nate Carter is going to be the number two running back, uh, which might surprise some folks because you know Adam Hine is a name that's been around for a long time. He's a senior. Naturally, you, you would have thought he'd be the second stringer, but that's not the case. Nate Carter is going to be that number two running back, and he's someone that's been compared to Brian Correa. In terms of you know his his work ethic, right. for, he's a walk on. Um, so I think that story is pretty nice. And you know what? He had a really good game last year against Nevada. Yes, it's in Nevada, but still, Absolutely. I mean, that first half he was he was terrific and he got positive yards. And he's someone that's scrappy. I mean, watching him during practice, these defenders can't bring him down. He's always moving his legs, and he's just a really yeah. tough physical presence in the backfield. And then of course you got Hine, the Mitchell Jerkins angle. I don't know if that will really play out much. I mean, maybe some sweeps, maybe some reverses, but they're not just going to hand it off to him and go up the middle. He didn't see that at all today in practice. Um, maybe you see Trey Dye do that a little bit more, a little bit, because mm -hmm. uh, he actually played running back out of high school. So maybe that's where the direction they go. Because uh, I just don't see the Jurgens angle playing out as a as a traditional running back. Maybe just a different variation of it, but. Uh, I really don't see that transpiring on the field at all. Maybe game. give him some carries from the slot position, like you said, on a sweep or some sort of reverse or something. Yeah, yeah that's, that's kind of where the direction I, I see that possibly uh, playing out. But, you know, I think then you got to add in Taysom. I think uh, to, to think that Taysom is not going to run. He, when there's an opening and there's a, a, a clear path for him to get some positive yards, he's going to take it. I mean, the first play on last Saturday, uh, day one of practice and 11-on-11 11 11 work, um, you know, he's checking down his receivers. There was nothing there. He went and he ran and he had no knee brace on and he was he was the Taysom of old. I mean, just you see Taysom and it's like that guy can he's got some wheels. He can move. Um, and there's no reason to think that he can't be that uh, rusher again. I mean, you you don't want to have him exposed. And he even mentioned that last fall. Mm -hmm. But uh, still, you know, he's someone that uh, he can bust open a big play. And it's crazy to think too that he, if he matches his total rushing total from 2013, he could become the all-time leading rusher in all of BYU history, which would be it's crazy for a quarterback. So Taysom is going to still get his yards on the ground. Is there any situation or any way that Harvey Longy gets some carries out of the backfield? I know he's been asked that, and I don't know if he's been directly asked that by his coaches yet, but what would need to happen to see him get a few a few touches back there? Well, I think, that, you know, Bronco today said that he's a – Longy, that is, is emerging as a defensive – or a leader – of the defense. So when that was said, I think that kind of put to rest any notion that he's going to be on, on, on the offensive side of the ball. And I think also, too, he's just got a higher ceiling as a linebacker. I think he's someone that could potentially be an NFL linebacker. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why they made the switch because I think it was just laid out in front of him, hey, you got more potential as a linebacker to get to the next level. I think his ceiling as a running back is kind of like an Algie Brown. I know he was really good at Bingham. But in the college level, I mean, there was no signs of that at Utah. Mm -hmm. um, I think the linebacker position is suited for him. He's a he's very physical, athletic. Um, I think he's going to be really good at the linebacker spot. He's going to start still up in the air what, whether or not uh, what's going to happen from the Miami Beach brawl uh, suspensions. Bronco right. mentioned that because obviously Longy was someone that was throwing some haymakers in that fight. Could he be suspended for Nebraska? We'll have to wait and see on that. But, you know, Longy is someone that I definitely think is going to be a line, uh, starter at that buck linebacker spot. I don't think there's any possibility of switching him to running back. Maybe Riley Burt, a cornerback out of Box Elder High School, they could possibly switch him to running back because that was his natural position in high school. But other than that, I don't think there's going to be any position switches. 
Yeah, I really one thing that I heard um, Harvey Longy saying this week was he kind of compared his poor preparation last year um, to what it takes to prepare to be a running back, which is basically know your blocker, know your hole, and then you're just kind of on your own. You make your own destiny as opposed to being a an assignment-based defense. He said I, it's just a much different world to have to learn my gap and learn my angles and learn my position, know where other guys are so it's, so that I know exactly how I work into that system. I was really encouraged to hear him talk like a linebacker, you know, like talk like a Bronco 3-4 linebacker because he didn't, and none of the linebackers played like that last year. There was so poor on the assignments, so poor on the angles, so poor on the communication with each other. Do you see the linebacking core kind of working as a cohesive group better in, you know, four days so far? Yeah, I do. I think the linebacking group is... I think arguably one of the deepest spots on this entire team, just in terms of sheer numbers and the potential ceiling for a lot of these guys, it's it's really high. I mean, there's a lot of players in this linebacking group um, that could be future stars in this program. It's just a matter now of it, of it all coming together, and I think Bronk is a key piece in that. Him now calling the plays, being in charge of the defense, um, that's important, and I think he just commands more respect than Nick Howell. It's no discredit to Nick Howell, but I think Bronco just commands a room Whereas, you know, Nick Howell just doesn't have that rapport, that, that track record. I mean, Bronco Mendenhall coached Brian Erlacher that demands respect. Um, and he just had, he's had a lot of history of, you know, good defenses over the year. And in the linebacker position especially, you know, BYU is becoming like a linebacker U where they get guys to the next level. And that's why they get top prospects at the linebacker position because guys know that you can get to the NFL linebacker. Other positions, maybe not. But a linebacker, you can really flourish at BYU and be highlighted and become a name nationally. Um, but I think Longy, I think guys like Fred Warner, say Tautu is becoming a leader according to Bronco today, and a guy like Austin Heater at the Mike linebacker spot. Those four guys, I would expect, depending on against suspensions, I think those are going to be your starters heading into Nebraska. And then you complement that with um, you complement that with Manoa Pakula, Jeremiah Luted Boyer, Sione Taki Taki. Obviously, he's spent. We'll probably get to that, obviously, but. Um, you know, I think you just got a nice group there that has a lot of potential. And I think, you know, it's in the defensive line is a spot too where I think they got some good numbers. They don't have that bona fide elite pass rusher. I know Bronco said Kafusi, he feels is his number one guy, but I still need to see more from Kafusi because he was fantastic with an elite rusher on the opposite side with Ziggy Anson in yeah. 2012. But since then, he's been plagued with injuries and just hasn't been the guy that I think all of us envisioned, and of course last year he played out of position. Um, mm -hmm. So so this year, he, he, he's not had, having a nice camp. Um, yesterday kind of struggled a little bit, but I think uh, kafusi has got to be someone that, that really takes off for this team, this defense to become what they, they want to be. BYU, all their successes in the past have been when they've had dominant pass rushers and dominant defenses in general. Last year was the obvious... They just had no defense and no pressure, so they were getting thrown over the top all the time. So this is kind of the segue. You segued into it. With Taki Taki getting suspended now at that deep linebacker position, who else do we expect to be suspended for that game? Because I know Bronco won't announce that until, you know, week the week of the game. But it's, we're almost expecting, like, half the team to be suspended for that game or at least, you know, a quarter or something. I think Bronco probably does more a half in a game. But – with the deep, you know, you talk a lot about the depth, but a lot of that depth is going to be gone for Nebraska. So who's going to be gone, and does that still leave BYU a shot if their depth is as good as you think it is? Yeah, so, you know, Bronco said today that they're, they're going to potentially announce any suspensions because he's already made decisions on that. Uh, he'll, he'll potentially announce those the week of the Nebraska game, and he might not even announce it. We might not find out until, you know, 3.30 Eastern, 1.30 Mountain when BYU takes on Nebraska in Lincoln to actually find out who, if any, you know, got suspended. Because he said back in spring, 10-ish players will receive discipline, whether or not that's a game suspension, whether that's some other sort of discipline that Bronco has in play. So it's not necessarily just games. Uh, but, I, you know, there's been rumblings that Kai Nakua, potentially Harvey Longy, as I mentioned earlier, those are the two maybe that stand out. Um, other than that, though, I mean, I don't think a guy like Karoma would get suspended because... I don't think that situation, when you just review what happened in that brawl, it just didn't seem like Karoma deserves to get spent. I mean, he had two guys coming at him with helmets. I mean, you can't be suspended. Yeah, he was getting him. in somebody's face, but it's he, not like he was grabbing face masks or throwing exactly. haymakers. 
To me, he was doing what an offensive lineman needs to do when guys are running toward your sideline and bumping into your quarterback. You got to get up and get nasty. That, but then you con- contrast that with Kainakua, who's blindsiding guys with full-on, you know, sideswipes. Yeah. It's a, it's a stark contrast. I think. I mean, can can we safely say Kainakua is not going to play in the first game? I, I mean, it's still. I mean, it's on camera. The talky talkie is only getting you know a game for something that actually had charges. I mean, honestly, sure. can you can you justify a game suspension for a fight after a college football game where there was high emotions? I mean, honestly, I would just move on and let it let it go. I mean, have we heard anything from Memphis suspending anyone? I I mean, I think it's just be moved on. But I I would imagine that Nakua does maybe get one game suspension and then. So after Nakua, you're then talking about Chris Badger, who's someone that's labeled as a coach on the field. I mean, he directs young guys to get into their positions. He's a really smart player. He's someone that, um, if he's not starting in the the safeties, he's going to be someone when they line up in nickel packages where he's going to be in that set. So Chris Badger would step in, and Eric Takanak at the cat back position. Safeties overall, I think, are a pleasant surprise in how much depth and numbers they got there. Um, because Takanaka, Chris Badger, even a walk-on Grant Jones has been someone who's had a nice uh, camp so far, and then Zane Anderson, a true freshman from Stansbury Park. So there's some numbers there that Bronco and the staff really like. So I think the safety position, if Nakua is in fact suspended, will be just fine when they take on Nebraska. I got to follow up on your safeties. I was thinking about this today, and you know, we talk about BYU having really good linebackers. They've had them pretty much for the last 20 years. They've had that one dominant linebacker every core every year. But they've also had really good safeties. You know, you had Aaron Francisco, Andrew Rich, Daniel Sorensen, some of these guys going on and playing in the NFL. Um, does BYU have that type of a safety on their team now? I think Kainakua. I think Kainakua is that guy. He's and he's another guy. Bronco said um, that there hasn't been one established leader of the defense, but there's a handful of guys, Bronson Kafusi, Kainakua, Seu Tautu, and Harvey Longi. Those are the four guys that he feels are emerging as leaders, and they're making a case for that. And I think that's promising. And kind of cool, I mean, you got go go back to last season, the Central Florida game. Craig Bills is out with a con- concussion. Kind of cool steps in, and Broncos says after that loss to the Knights, there was no drop-off in terms of play. And that's where you're talking about a senior leader in Craig Bills who was like a head hunter in that Houston game just weeks what prior. What number. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then against Central Florida, a young kid, in Kainakua, who hasn't seen many starts. I mean, I want to say, if I'm not mistaken, that was his first start. And there was no drop-off, according to Bronco. He felt that the, the level of play was up to what they've seen the past few weeks with Craig Bills in there. So I think that right there was high praise, and I think he started to realize this kid has a lot of potential. I mean, the, the sucker punch, if you will, is going to be something that probably haunts him for a long time yeah. in, in terms of the outside world. But, you know, I think he's moved on from it. I think he's probably better for it. And and, you know, I think if he does get that suspension, so be it. But, you know, I think he's definitely going to be someone that's a big-time contributor uh, in, in this for this team in 2015 and even next year. And, and BYU, like I said, has had a history of great safeties. I mean, like I said, Aaron Francisco, Jared Lee, Chris Ellison. I mean, you can go back all over the, over the years. They've had Sorenson. some stuff. Yeah, they've been yeah. a lot of great guys. And didn't I mean Kai played some quarterback in in high school? He's one of those guys that he that BYU brought in as a as an athlete, you know, playing the position of athlete. Um, and so he's got the brains, he's got the athleticism, he's obviously got the fire. I mean, if there's one thing that you look at uh, Broncos defensive backs and and well, and their linebackers as well is its physical play. It's hitting hard. It's ball hawking. It's being vocal from the backfield and. It just seems like Kainakua fits that bill in, in every respect. I I look forward to that, but I just don't know how this backfield is this defensive backfield is going to look. I mean, I know you, you talked about your starting four, and I saw you tweet out your starting four on the linebacker. Who do you got starting? We'll, we'll assume Kainakua plays in game one, but who's your yeah. starting defensive backs? Who plays field? Who plays boundary? Yeah, I think field corner, uh, it, it's kind of interesting. I initially thought Micah Hanneman was going to be a lock to be the starter now. His knee, only, though, right? He hasn't played yet. He has. He's still injured. He's got a sore knee. Um, hasn't even suited up. Hasn't put on shoulder pads. So um, so with that said, right now, knowing what we know at this point of fall camp, i got to think Michael Davis and Jordan Prater are going to be the starters. Prater's had a really good camp, and those guys... Yeah, and they got the games. A, they've got the games. they got the experience. They've had, they were starters last season. 
So I think you're going to go with that early on. Now, I wouldn't be surprised if maybe a Dion Lake emerges later in the season where he gets more experience because right. he's going to get some reps. Because physically, he looks the part. He's, I mean, he's someone in terms of true freshman out of a Utah high school at cornerback. I don't think I've any seen, seen many prospects like Dion Lake before just following BYU football over the years. But, you know, I think Michael Davis, Jordan Prater, and if Micah Hammond gets healthy, because this season's a long haul. I mean, four days, it's it seems like a big deal now, but... When Hanneman does get in the mix, I think his athleticism is something that's really exciting to, to these coaches, and they want to get him on the field because he had a fantastic spring. I mean, he was the only guy only guy that could even possibly hang with Mitch Matthews. Now, Mitch Matthews was dominating everyone, but, I mean, Mike Hanneman occasionally could, could hang with him. I think that was something to be said there because Mitch Matthews had one of the best springs, according to Bronco, that he's ever had or seen from a wide receiver as a college football coach. So... You know, I think the cornerbacks are going to be an issue, though. I mean, I think as for as much you know good things if you here and there that we've seen from Michael Davis and Prater with the pass breakups and the interceptions, I still think in a in a live game in a, a setting where you're not always familiar with the personnel on the other side of the ball, I think there's there's going to be times where BYU's given up a lot of yards, and there's going to be quarterbacks that are having career days like we always tend to see when BYU especially takes backup them. quarterbacks, right? Exactly. And so they're going to give up a lot of yards, but it's the key, I think, for this BYU defense as a whole is bend but don't break, kind of a signature of the early part, tenure of the Bronco uh, teams, 6 7 where they'd give up yards, but they'd limit teams to like that 17 to 20 points range. And if this team can do that, I mean, how explosive this offense is going to be. The offense, their goal is to average 40 points per game. So, Ooh. and I think they can, I think they can attain it. They had 37 last year. So I think that you know if, if this defense can hold teams to maybe 20, 24 points, it's going to set up the offense pretty nicely for some wins this year. Yeah, I'm personally – it's it doesn't seem, and maybe it's just the vocal minority on Twitter, which BYU Twitter is just an entire world in and of itself. <laughs> it but I love the Ben Don't Break philosophy. I think it works perfectly at BYU. BYU's worst, I think, Achilles heel is – recruiting the day and lake type athletes that can play DB and that can play man up defense. And so I think the way to, to, to combat that is to hang off. Like everyone hates seeing our corners off six to eight yards, but what it does is it forces supporting opposing quarterbacks to not make mistakes. We all know that it only takes one mistake in a drive to end everything, right? One errant throw on a first down, now you're looking at second and ten. You run on second down, and now you're looking at third and seven. And it, it, little, you let the other team beat you if they're going to beat you, but they're going to make mistakes. It's college. So I That's personally like the bendo break, and I think it works well you know, within the personnel that BYU has. I think that's why BYU relies on their strong safeties. You know, they're strong in their Absolutely. free safety, having just strong safety play in general because they know their athletic corners are not the athletic corners that can compete with the 6'4 wide receivers of, of P5 schools. And so they need those ball-hawking safeties that, again, we've talked about have been there for decades, really. And because it's their last line of defense, and those safeties are 20 yards off when those corners are – you know, six to eight yards off, and they're, they're, I mean, every team that's the last line of defense, but BYU safeties always seem to be the hard hitters to kind of let those receivers know, I'd rather you try and go around me because you come over the middle, you're going to get some. And what? I think that's where yeah. And I think a lot of BYU fans still remember playing Notre Dame and whatever it was, 2005 or something with, what was his name, Samarja out on the wing, and they were just throwing those those screen passes left and right, and BYU's corners were eight yards off, and they didn't have kind of the great linebacking core that they had now that could back that up. And it was just like eight, eight yards, nine yards, six yards, 12 yards, 40 yards. And BYU fans have been pulling their hair out since then, kind of seeing that, not realizing that – in the past five to six, you know, five to eight years, as the linebacking core has gotten really dominant, as B as Bronco has transferred to the three four defense, and and how everyone's bought into the system, we don't see that nearly as much. In fact, the screen play seems to be one of the least effective plays now against this defense. Some in in, in some years, last year everything was effective against this defense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, last year's defense was, was downright bad. I mean, statistically the worst defense in the last 21 years wow. of BYU football. I mean, one of the worst that Broncos ever fielded as a coach. But I think, 
I, I do agree. I think BYU, I mean, they, they do have to take on that bend but don't break approach because they, at the end of the day, as much as I was saying their their depth is improving, it's still an issue. And it's when you line up against UCLA, you're, you, I mean, every game you look at on the schedule for BYU, those that opposition probably has more depth, probably has more skill position talent just because that's just the nature of BYU. Even back in the 80s and the glory years, I mean, BYU was always at a deficit when it came to skill and, and athleticism. But, I mean, they killed them with execution and precision routes and, and just a nasty physical presence in the trenches. And that's where I think BYU's got to get better is getting nasty in the trenches and having that physical pre- presence up front. Yeah, and they battled it with innovation, too. I mean, really, Lavelle Edwards and the air attack really was ahead of the ball on that. And and that's kind of what you have to do when you when you think about the teams. You know, Boise State actually being, obviously being the darling for so long. Let's be honest. They got there by running Statue of Liberty plays, you know, and hook and ladders. And so it takes a certain amount of, I don't want to call it gimmicks, but innovation, creativeness, I, I think, I think BYU can do that, and I'd like to see them both offensively and defensively go about that. Before we wrap up, though, I did want to mention one thing. You know, a lot of it, a lot of talk has been happening about the fights breaking out of practice. You know, you relate that back to last year and the, the, the brawl in the bowl game and BYU being the fifth worst penalized team in the country. The number one worst, the number one penalty BYU got last year was personal fouls, which is obviously huge. What what's going to happen? Is this year going to be better? Are they going to have fewer penalties? Are they going to fight less? Are they going to fish less? Are they going to eight? Was it was eighty-seven yards or something ridiculous per game that they were penalized last year. Eighty-one yards a game, one hundred and ten I mean, penalties, like eleven hundred yards. It's just pathetic. That's that kills drives. Not only does it kill drives, I, just, I remember last season how many penalties there were on the special teams. I've never seen so many yes! so, so many personal fouls on special teams. I think Offsides? I mean, I've never seen as many offsides in an entire football yeah. season and I, as I saw in some games. It was a weekly occurrence, and yeah, there was multiple times in one game, I want to say like the Nevada game was really bad uh, for it. But yeah, I think the, I think the um, you know Bronco mentioned this today, and it's, it kind of stood out how you know, because yesterday, with those uh, little scuffles they had uh, during practice, I mean, he, he punished them. He, he made them, the players go through a series of exercises where they did sit-ups, push-ups, leg lifts, leg kicks, just over and over and over and over for like 30 to 40 minutes. And these players were just screaming by the end of it how much pain they were in. But I think it was just a lesson that you have to be disciplined. And every time a player has like a false start or, or commits a penalty – they have to go to the sideline to their position coach and do 10 to 20 up downs, uh, you know, just up down, up down, and, and you know, I think they're just trying to instill that discipline that that penalties cannot happen for this team because when you have a kicking game that's still kind of shaky. I know today was a smiley emoji, if you will, according to Bronco, but um, that's right, you know, he's talking in emojis now. Yeah, for- Bronco, Bronco talking emojis might be the best thing ever. I just can't wait till he throws up the 100 sign or something, or he has the, you know. The, I'm weak sign or something, something like that. But, um, but you know, when you combine the fil- like penalties are huge because you don't have a a, a a special teams unit that can swing the field the field position battle. I mean, you, you think Johnny Linehan's going to be maybe like a poor? You hope that they're going to be maybe like a poor man's Tom Hackett in terms of that right. rugby style kick because he was such a huge thing for Utah. You huge. hope that that you can have that uh, for BYU because if you do, then you're going to maybe have some short fields and you can maybe afford a penalty or two here and there because you got the field position in your favor. But I don't think that's something that BYU can bank on. So they're always going to be facing that deficit in terms of field position. You cannot have, you know, going 70, 80 yards every drive. You can't afford those penalties because Taysom, as amazing as he is, you can't be trying to get touchdowns or points every time going 70 or 80 yards. So they got to clean that up. To, to wrap it up, I, I want to. I, I think we'd be remiss not to mention it. But with the Colby Jorgensen um, injury that happened yesterday, what what effect did that have on the team? To see an injury, I mean, that's a pretty serious injury that was almost life threatening type of an injury to happen on the field. I, I know I played sports. I mean, I ended my my basketball playing career by dislocating my elbow, and I know what that impact had on me individually. But on a team, that can that can polarize a team. It can really hold you back or can really push you forward. 
What did you see from the team yesterday when that happened and, and their kind of response? Yeah, I mean, when, when it happened, I mean, Jorgensen went down and obviously a lot of trainers went and attended to him. And I don't think really anyone, the team, even in the media that was there, the, even the fans at the open practice, I mean, I don't think they realized the extent, the nature of that injury at the time. You know, he, he was carted you? off. Yeah, he was carted off. And, and, you know, that's always a scary situation when you're getting carted off. But um, I, I still think anyone, including the team, realized the, the extent of how serious that was. And then news came out from, from Jared Lloyd from the Daily Herald, you know, saying what exactly happened. I mean, that was just kind of like, I mean, he could have been paralyzed, you know, how, how serious that was. So, yeah, that, that was unfortunate. Yeah. Obviously, he's out for the season. But, I mean, that's the lace of his worries, and it's, and it's kind of sad, too, when you factor just a week ago, he's, he's married, he's getting married and enjoying life at the – the height of everything there, and then the next week to maybe possibly have you know, being paralyzed. I mean, it's just kind of crazy how life can turn that fast. Yeah, I, chat, I saw Chad Lewis tweet earlier this evening, and it looks like the prognosis is good. Our hearts, our thoughts go out to uh, Jorgensen and his family. Um, and we thank you, Mitch. I think we got to wrap up, but thanks for coming on the show tonight, man. Yeah, happy to do it. It was a, it was a pleasure coming on, guys. Appreciate it. Make sure you follow Mitch at Mitch underscore Harper. Also, his podcast, Cougar Center Podcast. Get, tell me if I get this right. At Cougar underscore Center. Yeah, we got to have the underscores. I, I hate that underscore, but we're stuck with it. So, yeah. You yeah, the underscore. It, it gives a nice cadence yeah. to it. Cougar <laughs> underscore Center. <laughs> yeah, and you can always, obviously check it out on 1320kfan.com and also check out my BYU Insider blog. I do practice updates and reports, depth charts, everything that you need to know from fall camp. Yeah, Mitch is 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 a go-to guy for BYU stuff, and he really enjoys his his job a lot. You can see from the the, the picture I posted oh, on Twitter man. earlier. About that Periscope <laughs> stuff. I, I I gotta be on point now. I gotta, yeah. I gotta be on fleek, if you will, as the kids say. I mean, I gotta be on my A game because BYU TV Sports they're coming in hot with those Periscopes. Yeah. I gotta be ready. I gotta be ready was, for them. It was the first thing I saw as soon as I turned on that Periscope. I see Mitch doing doing one of these. <laughs> like, oh, gotta. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was Hayson talking about jumping, throwing the football, and I don't know why I had that face, but yeah, not not my best look, uh, not my best. <laughs> well, thanks, for, thanks again, Mitch. Uh, make sure you follow us at Sports Bros, and you can read all our stuff and download all our podcasts on iTunes and Stitcher. Our online home is tornedbysports.com. We'll see everybody again next week, and go Cougars. <laughs>